Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding HF Direction Finding. In this presentation, we'll provide a short technical overview of how direction finding methodologies are used to locate emitters operating at HF. This presentation assumes a basic understanding of ionospheric or sky wave propagation at HF. If you're not familiar with this topic, or if you'd like a brief review, you might want to watch the presentation Understanding HF Propagation before beginning this presentation. Please also see an introduction to direction finding if you'd like more detailed explanations of some of the direction finding methodologies mentioned in this presentation. Direction finding, also sometimes referred to as radiolocation, is the process of estimating either the direction towards or the location of an emitter. This is done by measuring and evaluating the properties of the signals produced by the emitter, most often by looking at changes in the amplitude, frequency, and or phase of the received signal. There are many different ways of performing DF, and these different methods will have varying performance parameters, such as speed or accuracy, as well as different system sizes and costs. All DF systems consist of two principal elements, namely a specialized antenna and a direction finder or scanner that processes the signals received from the antenna and then uses this information to produce a direction or location result. As can be seen from the pictures on the right, DF systems can be man portable, can be mounted to different types of vehicles, or be installed as fixed or semi-fixed sites. HF, or high frequency, refers to signals in the range of approximately 3 to 30 MHz. Under the right conditions, these signals can be refracted or bent back down towards Earth by the ionosphere. We'll go into more detail on this in just a few moments. This refraction makes HF well suited for very long-range applications. In many cases, global coverage is achievable using HF. The first widespread application of HF direction finding was by the Royal Navy during the Second World War. Special antennas and receivers were used to obtain the general location of a German U-boat by DFing its communication signals. In modern times, HFDF is still used in numerous applications. Militaries worldwide are the primary users of HF direction finding, and intelligence agencies are regular users as well. Spectrum monitoring or regulatory authorities, such as the United States Federal Communications Commission, use HFDF to geolocate sources of interference. And finally, HFDF can also be helpful in search and rescue operations, particularly in maritime environments. In order to understand HFDF, we first need to review HF propagation. There are three common HF propagation modes. The first of these, line of sight propagation, is exactly what the name implies. Signals propagate from the antenna in a more or less straight line. HF signals can, however, also follow the curvature of the Earth, and this is commonly referred to as either surface wave or ground wave. Neither of these propagation modes poses any particular challenges for direction finding. Skywave propagation, on the other hand, involves a signal being refracted by the ionosphere, a layer of charged particles around the Earth. Traditional skywave involves signals reaching the ionosphere with a low elevation or takeoff angle relative to the Earth's surface. A special form of skywave is something called NIVIS, or Near Vertical Incident Skywave. Unlike traditional skywave, NIVIS uses a very high elevation angle and uses low frequency signals launched almost straight up at the ionosphere to cover regions relatively close to the transmitter. The ionosphere plays an important role in both types of skywave propagation, but the ionosphere is also a highly variable propagation medium, and as we'll see, this variability can create significant challenges for direction finding at HF. Next, let's take a look at the three most important HFDF methodologies, namely triangulation, 
single site location, and time difference of arrival. We'll spend the remainder of this presentation discussing each of these methodologies and their relative advantages and disadvantages. Azimuth information, or lines of bearing, are needed for both triangulation as well as for single site location, and this information can be obtained in three different ways. The first is by manually rotating a directional antenna until maximum signal strength is observed. Bearings can also be obtained via automatic methodologies. Watson Watt is the original DF methodology at HF and dates back to World War II. It uses a pair of cross-loop antennas, often also called adcock antennas, where each pair creates a pattern with lobes along one axis and nulls perpendicular to the axis. Azimuth is determined by measuring and comparing the difference in received amplitude on both axes, with an additional sense antenna used to resolve any 180 degree ambiguities. Watson Watt is still widely used today, but a more modern methodology, correlative interferometry, can also be applied to HFDF. In this case, a circular array of antenna elements receives the signal of interest and the phase offsets seen at each element are used to estimate the angle of arrival. We won't go into more detail on these methodologies in this presentation, so please see the separate presentation in Introduction to Direction Finding if you'd like more information about these different methods of obtaining azimuth information. Triangulation, sometimes also called multi-angulation, uses azimuth information obtained from any of the DF methodologies we just discussed. Here, multiple geographically distributed DF stations each obtain lines of bearing on the signal of interest. These stations may be either fixed or mobile, and they can use any appropriate methodology for obtaining these bearings. The closest intersection of these lines of bearing is the estimated emitter location. Note that bearing lines, and in particular bearing lines made at HF, rarely converge on a single point, so the emitter location is often given as a circle or region where the lines come closest to each other. It should also be noted that stations must communicate with each other or with a central location to obtain a triangulation result. These results can be either determined manually by plotting locations and bearings on a map, or more often by means of an automated system. Triangulation is the oldest and simplest DF methodology and is well understood. The accuracy of triangulation results at HF does, however, often depend on the locations of the DF stations relative to the emitter location. Ideally, the lines of bearing should be taken from all sides of the emitter. Poor geometry of the DF stations, as shown here, can lead to a significant loss of accuracy. Given that the location of the emitter is typically not known in advance, a relatively dense network or a high number of stations may be needed to provide adequate coverage over a large geographical area. A dense network is also desirable in that the more stations there are, the higher the probability of obtaining a sufficient number of high-quality bearings. This is because some stations in an HFDF network may not receive the signal of interest due to fading, being in the skip zone, etc. Which stations are useful at a given time will change based on ionospheric conditions and the frequency of the signal of interest. Triangulation uses multiple stations because a single azimuth, or line of bearing, only produces a direction, but not a distance. In other words, the target emitter could be anywhere along a single line of bearing. However, with knowledge of ionospheric conditions, it's possible to calculate the distance to an emitter from only a single site. Let's look at how this works. Skywave signals are refracted from the ionosphere at a given actual height, and this can be used to derive a virtual height, which would produce the same effect if the signal were specularly reflected at an angle. Using this height and the received signal's elevation angle, the distance to the emitter can be calculated. In this way, a single DF site 
can determine location from both azimuth and distance. It is, however, very important to keep in mind that this single site location technique can only be used to DF signals that are received via skywave propagation. In order to use single site location effectively, the virtual height of the ionosphere is needed. Due to the variable nature of the ionosphere, this is a function of both frequency and ionospheric conditions. Since ionospheric conditions are continually changing, the virtual height must be calculated at the time the azimuth estimate or line of bearing is obtained. In practice, ionospheric conditions are usually derived from various models, which are then corrected or adjusted using real-time measurements of the ionosphere. These measurements or soundings can be made using active vertical probes or ionosons, such as the one illustrated on the right, or they can be made using passive, oblique, that is, non-vertical measurements of known stations. One limitation of sounding is that it only measures small regions of the ionosphere, and therefore it may not necessarily reflect the ionospheric conditions at the point from which the HF skywave signal of interest was refracted. Single-site HFDF systems are easily implemented as either a fixed site or as a mobile-slash-transportable system. And since a location can be obtained by only a single station, a dense network of DF stations is not required. Note, however, that the accuracy provided by this methodology very much depends on how accurately the state of the ionosphere can be modeled and or measured in the direction of the emitter. It's also worth mentioning that for most DF systems, elevation accuracy is typically less than azimuthal accuracy. Two important limitations of single site location are that it does not work on line of sight or surface wave signals, and it also does not work if signals cannot be received, for example when the DF station is located in the emitter's skip zone. The last methodology we'll discuss is time difference of arrival, or TDOA. Here, three or more DF stations in different geographical locations each receive a target signal. In most cases, the paths or distances between the emitter and each station are different, so the signal will arrive at different times at different stations. These time differences can be represented as curves or hyperboli centered on each station, and the intersection of these hyperboli corresponds to the emitter location. It's also possible to integrate TDOA into a hybrid direction-finding approach, in which some stations generate hyperboli and some stations generate bearings. These bearings can be used to identify where the emitter is located along one or more hyperboli. In this example, there is ambiguity when using only two TDOA stations, because their hyperboli cross at two points. But this ambiguity is easily resolved by introducing a line of bearing obtained from a third station. TDOA DF stations are very low cost and low complexity compared to bearing based DF stations. This is important given the large number of stations needed to obtain accurate results. One reason why these stations are inexpensive and simple is that they do not require a directional antenna. They simply have to record and digitize the signal along with a very accurate timestamp. One drawback of TDOA is that it does often require a fairly dense sensor network, and the sensors must be placed in such a way that they cover the expected geographical area containing the emitter. If the emitter is outside of this area, then results may be suboptimal. The other limitation is station networking and synchronization requirements. Because precise timing is critical in TDOA, stations must share a time reference, and this is almost always provided by GPS. In addition, a high bandwidth network connection is needed for sending the digitized signals and their timestamps to a central location for processing. Before we conclude this presentation, let's discuss some of the ways of preventing or hindering direction finding of HF signals. 
The first set of recommendations involves making the signal difficult to receive or intercept. Since DF cannot be performed, if the target emitter signals are not reliably received. This approach includes using low power signals, using short duration signals, and or using frequency hopping or spread spectrum signals. Another way of preventing a signal from being DF'd is by transmitting it co-channel with another signal coming from a geographically separate location. Although some DF systems have the ability to perform super resolution and independently DF multiple signals on the same frequency, having multiple co-channel emitters usually makes it difficult to obtain unambiguous lines of bearing. For skywave transmissions, it's sometimes possible to choose frequencies and elevation angles that would cause adversary DF stations to be in the skip zone and thus be unable to receive or DF those transmissions. And finally, NIVIS transmissions are more difficult to DF than standard low elevation angle skywave signals. NIVIS signals are transmitted and received almost vertically, so very little energy can be received via line of sight or via ground wave. The high elevation angles used in NIVIS also are difficult for many DF systems to accurately measure. Let's end with a brief summary. Direction finding at HF often involves skywave or ionospheric propagation, and this is what most often distinguishes HFDF from other forms of direction finding. HFDF is primarily performed in military and government applications, including general spectrum monitoring, interference hunting, and search and rescue operations. There are three major approaches to direction finding at HF. The first, oldest, and simplest of these is triangulation, which estimates emitter location by combining azimuth information, or lines of bearing, from multiple geographically separated stations. Single site location can estimate emitter location using only a single station, but it requires knowledge of ionospheric conditions in order to obtain distance along a line of bearing. And finally, time difference of arrival can calculate emitter location by comparing the different times at which a signal was received at different locations. This concludes our presentation, Understanding HF Direction Finding. If you'd like to learn more about HF, direction finding, or spectrum monitoring and direction finding solutions from Rody and Schwartz, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit us at rody-schwartz.com.